we are going to present a brief history of the French Revolution and we shall seek to look at the historical forces that brought this cataclysmic event about in France in 1789. France in the late 18th century, it was widely perceived, was in a state of crisis. We need to look at the nature of this crisis in France in late 18th century in the context of uh, French society, French economy and the political structure that France had inherited from earlier times. Inter alia, we shall also look at the intellectual ambience in France about that time, which can only be understood only in the context of European enlightenment of the 18th century. In the first uh, uh, lecture, we simply look at the crisis in France during what is usually known as the Ashia regime. And we also look at the intellectual uh, climate of the time. Now, if we are uh, looking for a possible crisis uh, in France in late 18th century, we must first of all need to look at the social, economic and political conditions of France. French society in late 18th century was patently in a state of crisis. It was unequal and at a level unreasonable and therefore anachronistic. The French society was divided into three estates according to the old medieval division of the society. Society in reality was divided into three corporate structures. The first estate comprised the clergy, the second the nobility and the third the rest of the population. While the first two together represented between 4 and 6 percent of the French population, the third estate represented the remaining more than 94 percent of the French population. It included everyone from the archbishops, the bishops, the higher clergy to the parish priest and uh, the rather poor uh, lower clergy. Now, we must understand the clergy was not a homogeneous class. It was not a social class. <clears throat> it was not a homogeneous group either. The upper clergy came from the aristocracy, while the lower clergy in the social origin were members of the third estate. So there was a big difference even within the clergy, though they represented one estate. The church was one of the biggest landowners in France. Church owned about one third of the land. The total income of uh, the clergy, it has been estimated, was about 130 million livres. Some of the upper clergy were very rich. The bishop of uh, uh, Strasbourg, for example, had an income of 400,000 livres. All the archbishops, 139 of them, came from the ranks of the aristocracy. Therefore, while the upper clergy had all the influence as France was a Catholic country, social influence, political influence, virtual fiscal immunity, the lower clergy shared the aspirations and the grievances of the common people, namely the third estate. Here again, we do not encounter a class that was homogeneous, that was a, a monolithic in a way. There were two broad differences amongst the nobility. One was the noblest depe or nobility of the sword. The other was the noblest the robe or the nobility of the robe. The first were the hereditary aristocracy who could trace their lineage to the medieval times. Whereas the nob noblest of the robe were in a manner of speaking the, the officials who rose to the ranks of aristocracy thanks to the munificence of the king. In France, there was a system of venality. One could buy offices. And by buying offices, the bourgeoisie who had made money uh, tried to elevate their social status. 
some of them in due course of time were also elevated to aristocracy by the king. Now there was a basic tension between these two groups, the noblesse d'epée and the noblesse de robe. Those of the aristocracy who combined their income from their uh, land sources with patronage of the court were better off. So those noblemen in the remote areas far removed from the splendor of the court at Versailles had a reason to feel aggrieved because their economic conditions sometimes were bad. Now it is because of these that, that they often were obliged to contract matrimonial alliances with the bourgeoisie, though the bourgeoisie were inferior in social rank and uh, status. Whereas the noblesse of the robe uh, were relatively better off. So even within the nobility there were problems, you know, economic problems even. But what rankled with the nobles more was the loss of their political uh, power. Louis XIV had successfully clipped the wings of both the clergy and the nobility. He had made royal power absolute and some of the institutions of noble power, for example the Parlement, had been kept virtually in disuse. As a result, the aristocracy were always opening for an opportunity to reassert their authority. They wanted a share of the political power. They were not against the monarch, but they simply wanted to have their own political position redefined and reassigned to them. Of the third estate, the most important part was the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie uh, were, were people associated with the world of commerce and industry and, and finance. They were associated with the new kind of uh, a mode of production which had been characterizing the economies of Europe since the late medieval period, namely the capitalist mode of production. They were the captains of industry, whatever industry had come, they engaged in commerce, they held high offices and uh, originally the term bourgeoisie is, is uh, uh, derived from a uh, bourg or bourg. Uh, you will notice that many uh, towns and cities in Europe end with the suffix of bourg, Strasbourg for example or Hamburg or Edinburgh which ends with a bourg, B-U-R-G-H. So the bourgeoisie a, by definition was a town dweller and therefore they were associated with the kind of economic activities that one would associate with the urban areas within the urban mode of production. Now the bourgeoisie also as Lefebvre has shown was not a homogeneous social class. There were differences amongst them from the richest to relatively poor. Now we have the administrative bourgeoisie, those who occupied the higher offices within the uh, 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 royal court and in the royal government. Uh, bourgeoisie of the world of finance, the bankers, the money lenders, those who dealt with money, etc. There were the intellectuals, the first two were the more moneyed classes. There were the inter professional classes, the lawyers, the teachers, the, the literateurs. And uh, what Lefebvre calls the, those impecunious men of talent, the intellectuals who did not always have money, who did not always uh, feel happy with the way things were going, but who had considerable talent and had the chance of influencing people also by an exercise of this talent. The bourgeoisie then was divided. There were also the lower ranks of the bourgeoisie, sometimes called the petite bourgeoisie. Amongst them we have small shopkeepers, uh, owners of artisanal uh, production, uh, uh, workshops, uh, small owners of, cap owners of small capital, uh, some kind of rentiers even. And uh, they overall constituted what can be called the lower bourgeoisie or the petite bourgeoisie. Apart from the, the, the bourgeoisie where of course, very important in the society and the leading segment of the so-called third estate. They were educated men, talented men, many of them had money, but what they ruled most 
was the irrational inequality on which the society was based. They, in spite of their talent, often found roads blocked to them, doors blocked to them, because status and privilege depended on birth. It is against this that they took up their cudgels. They have been doing it for a long time. The, when the conjuncture favored them, it is the bourgeoisie who laid the move towards the revolution. They wanted change also because they have imbibed enlightenment and they had ideas about alternative. The hollowness of the Ashia regime, the unreasonableness of the existing uh, society and politics had been laid bare to them by the philosophers. The next and the most numerous uh, part of the third estate and indeed of the whole population of France, it had been the peasantry. The peasants uh, constituted, it has been estimated, about 67 percent of the population whereas they owned only about 33 percent of the land. Now overall, it cannot be argued that the condition of the peasants in France had been very bad. You know, compared to their brethren in Eastern Europe, the French peasantry was better off in a sense that uh, feudalism had declined in France uh, pretty early on. But the peasants were also divided. There were big peasants, those who had substantial amount of land, they were known as the Gros Fermier. But there were also other small peasants and peasants without any land. Uh, there were the agricultural laborer as well or uh, the sharecroppers. Uh, these various kinds of peasants were known in different regions as journalier, labourier, manoeuvrier and also the sharecroppers were known as metaillier. And then there were the agricultural labourers. As we see, some of them were landowners. They owned uh, about one third of the land in France. Indeed, one third of the peasantry was also some kind of a landowner, but two thirds were plainly not. But what rankled with them the most was the persistence of feudalism in certain respects. One respect was the seigneurial due. The seigneurial dues are the dues which the peasants under feudalism owed to the landlords. Labor, for example, corvi or forced labor. Now, feudalism had disappeared virtually, but some of the feudal relations plainly had not. There was corvi in certain areas occasionally, but that apart there were a host of taxes that they had to pay, you know, seigneurial dues, shall we call it, that they had to pay to the landlord. They are the banalite. A whole lot of, uh, you know, small dues which was due to the landlord. The peasants resented it, but they had to pay it. For example, if they had to bake a bread, they had to take it to the bakery of the landlord. If they wanted to press their grape, they had to use the wine press of the landlord and pay more, while they would have paid less for this facility elsewhere. If there was a small bridge across a small rivulet in the village, uh, they had to pay to the landlord for use of that. It was also seen when during the peasant revolution on the eve of July 1789, they rose against the landlords and burned the uh, manor court, the manor houses, because that's where the records of their obligations were. Right? In the urban areas also, there was lack of work. There were a number of people without any sub ostensible means of uh, livelihood. There were vagabonds and indeed uh, right through the 18th century, particularly towards the end from the 1760s onwards, were notices on the part of the government and anxiety about these vagabonds, about the, the poor, uh, about people who wandered from one region to the other and there had been legislation to control them, to control what they called vagabondage. Now, it, it is in this way these people were also quite plainly aggrieved. So the social condition was such that the popular saying was that, that the clergy prayed, the nobility played, and the people paid. 
uh, their only obligation was to pay the taxes, but they were not privy to any of the privileges which were reserved for the upper two estates. France was an absolutist monarchy. This was summed up by Louis XIV uh, when he said, L'État, c'est moi, I am the state. Now, this complete personification of the monarch with the state is what has been called the absolutist monarchy. That all the uh, institutions which the medieval constitution had produced had virtually been put in abeyance by the overwhelming authority that Louis XIV was able to establish and exercise. Now, this we had noticed earlier had caused grievance amongst the nobility so far as their political power was concerned. The state was absolute but incompetent. Now, an absolutist state depends on the quality of the monarch. France in course of the 18th century had not been well served in this respect. Louis XIV's successor, Louis XV, had been more interested in his pleasure than in the business of governance. Louis XVI, when he became the king in 1774, was inexperienced and young, and he did not prove to be a particularly capable leader either. In this way, the political structure was absolutist, but also inefficient at the same time. Uh, the administration was inefficient because it continued the old structure and had not been modernized at all. There was a distinct lack of coordination and uh, a, a kind of a indolent king or a king who is not very seriously interested in governance did not really inspire an inept administration. When towards the end of Louis XV's reign, Mopiu again affected what has been described as a royal coup by making the parliaments obsolete once more. It was felt that royal absolutism would be re-established. But Louis XVI allowed the parliament to reconvene in order to gain popularity, but this was seen as a sign of weakness on the part of the king. This engagement between the nobles and the monarchy had been very old indeed and the nobles were forever looking for a sign of weakness on the part of the monarchy to reassert their authority. So even politically, uh, uh, even in so far as the political situation was concerned, uh, France was obviously in a state of crisis. There was a crisis of governance. French economy was not in a disastrous uh, uh, shape. France had done reasonably well in course of the uh, 18th century. Uh, Ernest Labrousse, who had uh, worked on the economic movements, movements of prices and wages right through the 18th century, had provided a wealth of data and statistics. He has shown that prices certainly rose more than wages did or rents did. This did create an imbalance. But between 1730 and 1770, more or less, uh, there was good agricultural production accompanied by demographic growth and a rise in overseas commerce. Indeed, up to 17, late 1760s, France's overseas commerce uh, could compare favorably with uh, that of England. It is after that that one notices a fairly steady decline. But even within this, France uh, or France's economy uh, had witnessed cyclical depression, that a period of prosperity would be followed by a period of depression, then there would be a recovery once more. It seemed that in the mid 1780s, there was a depression once more. The wine prices had fallen by 50 percent in the 1770s. Grape production and wine production had been one of the major economic activities or, or cash crops in, in, in France. In, uh, on the eve of the revolution in 1787 and 88, there had been a drought, uh, lack of rain, and uh, this caused uh, a failure of harvest. 
But what was more significant was the fiscal crisis. When Louis XVI became the king in 1774, Turgot, who was a minister and also a very significant philosopher of the time, warned, quote, the first gunshot would drive the state into bankruptcy, unquote. But his warning was not heeded. Indeed, France had fought wars right through the 18th century and spent a whole lot of money. And when for the first time uh, there was an attempt to make a budget, it was seen that France had a deficit of about 20 percent. It spent 20 percent more than it earned. Now, how could this fiscal problem be solved? The only way was to introduce reform to bring in some kind of equality in taxation, to do away with the fiscal immunities that the first two estates more or less enjoyed. The aristocracy led the revolt. They said we are agreeable to pay taxes, but taxes can be imposed not by the monarchy, but by the states general. This was a direct challenge thrown to the notion of absolutist monarchy, things that the monarchy could not do, that only an assembly of the people could do. And therefore, it is the fiscal crisis that really led to the, that, that kind of acted as a catalyst in bringing the crisis to the fore. The other crises all seem to have created a conjuncture on the eve of 1789 that led to the revolution. In European history, the 18th century is the era of enlightenment. The French called it le siècle de lumière, literally the century of light. Now, the enlightenment uh, was to inspire a daring to know, to, to reform, to change. The enlight enlightenment tried to understand the existing world in its own terms. Usually the uh, century of enlightenment is taken from 1689 when Mothesque was born to 1789 when Holbach died. Mothesque, who was a great admirer of the English constitution and English traditions, who had virtually introduced comparative sociology. There was Voltaire, whose satire particularly targeted the church. His anti-clericalism was very influential indeed in late 18th century. And it, it was to have a direct impact on the course of the revolution. It has been said that Voltaire harnessed the horse of reason and Rousseau unchained the tiger of emotion. He was in favor of toleration and he was against social injustice. Rousseau is an amazing genius, a lonely man, a very honest man. He was probably the greatest of the philosophers of the time and certainly had the most direct impact on the revolution. He, in his social contract, Rousseau talked of a contract which was a product of what we call general will, not the will of the majority. Volonté général and Volonté de tous. It is Rousseau who had put forward the doctrine of popular sovereignty. The sovereignty lies, after all, with the people, though it probably would be uh, expressed through the elected legislators. They are the encyclopedists, Denis Diderot and D'Alembert. They had produced 35 volumes. Now, the entire encyclopedia was not just about collecting information, but also to inculcate a new attitude. You collect information to know better and to know better to question better and then also perhaps to act. Then we have uh, Helvetius or Holbach who dealt with psychology. Helvetius felt that people wanted change in quest of happiness and happiness is uh, the main uh, searched for object of uh, change. Uh, Holbach tried to give a materialistic uh, explanation of the universe. In this way, the philosophers had
prepare the soil as it were, where the lack of reason in the existing structure was being made bare. The bourgeoisie, the educated, the literate who had imbibed uh, enlightenment, who had read these ideas, new ideas, very readily greeted them, used them to, to enrich their understanding, their judgment and then to act on such judgment, on such understanding. Now, a question can certainly be asked, uh, to what extent can we say that it affected the uneducated people as well? There was contact, there was dissemination in the coffee houses, in the salons, in the pubs, in the political clubs which had mushroomed on the eve of the revolution. There was contact between the literate and the uneducated. And in this way, ideas, uh, perhaps in a slight, in a, in a vulgarized fashion, uh, in a cruder fashion, got transmitted. There was another aspect to which Robert Dunton had uh, drawn our attention, is the role of the print culture. Now, there was a high enlightenment, but Dunton talks of also the low life of literature of the libellists, the pamphleteers. Now, they wrote, they wrote you know, in, on, on many things and some of them were downright pornographic in their uh, content. But it, it is a curious phrase that Danton uses, a philosophic pornography. The book lists of the time show that the works of the philosophers and the work of the libellists were put together in the list of the publishers and the booksellers for uh, sale. So what the philosophers did was to subvert the old structure in the minds of the French people long before the structures were actually brought down. What the libellists did was to quote uh, Danton, desacralized and demystified monarchy, unquote. 